This is a review of the types of memory. The first type of memory we'll look at is short-term memory. This type of memory is a catch-all term for the temporary storage of information over tens of seconds. You would use your short-term memory for looking up a phone number and dialing it. Another term for short-term memory is immediate memory. Your short-term memory has a limited capacity. A common misconception of short-term memory is that it acts as a single dynamic buffer in the brain through which all information is filtered through and either lost or stored. However, this is not the case. It is the case that different sensory modalities have their own temporary memory capacities operating parallel systems. Another name for short-term memory is working memory in that it acts to solve immediate problems. Within the short-term memory system, the phonological loop stores short segments of what somebody says. The visual buffer holds a limited amount of visual information retained from a visual scene. What is known as the central executive controls access to the phonological loop, the visual buffer, and temporary storage for other modalities via a sort of attentional selection process. Attention and working memory are closely intertwined, and so the more working memory is taxed, the less effective attention is in discarding distractors. Working memory can be used to add, follow a recipe, or copy line drawings, among other simple tasks. Working memory is also tied to performances on IQ tests and has a small storage capacity, semantic representation, and short duration. So without active rehearsal, its content can fade within a minute. Now we will discuss long-term memory. Long-term memory can store information for hours, days, or years, and seemingly has a limitless storage capacity. Long-term memory can be broken down into several categories, the first two of which are explicit or declarative memory and implicit or non-declarative memory. Explicit or declarative memory is involved in the conscious evocation of facts or events from the past. Declarative memory seems to have awareness and that it is a term for information which is available for the conscious recollection and verbal retrieval of information. So therefore this type of memory can be declared. The two major types of declarative memory are semantic memory, which retrieves facts, and episodic memory, which can retrieve events. Furthermore, in episodic memory, the information you retrieve is autobiographical, so episodic memory gives you a notion of who you are. On the other hand, semantic memory allows you to abstract facts form relationships, understand the meaning of words, and have ideas about culture, law, and science. As a result, both semantic memory and episodic memory are forms of declarative memory because as you use them to retrieve information, you are aware that you are using this information. Non-declarative memory, otherwise known as implicit memory, is a catch-all phrase for all the other types of memory which are less accessible to conscious recollection and verbal retrieval. Your non-declarative or implicit memory allows for skills and habits. For example, you may know how to tie your shoelaces or how to ride a bicycle using implicit memory, but if asked to verbalize how you do these things, it is difficult. Non-declarative memory is sometimes called procedural memory, or knowing how to do something as distinct from declarative memory, which is knowing that something is true. Patients with anterograde amnesia, a memory disorder affecting the ability to form new memories, often have little ability to form new declarative memories, but may be relatively spared in the ability to form a new non-declarative memory. 
So you can see that among the implicit memory, there are two major types that can be distinguished, procedural memory involving skills and emotional conditioning. As a type of implicit memory, procedural memory comprises of an inability to directly and consciously recall skills. However, attention and consciousness are most likely still necessary to learn these skills. And so again brings up the idea that it is difficult to teach sensory motor skills in the abstract or by simply talking about them. As a result, the memory formation and procedural memories requires practice and rehearsing, which coaches often refer to when, for example, learning how to shoot a basketball as muscle memory. And so if we think back to the idea of the behavioral zombie, such a zombie would have a functional procedural memory. Procedural memory can be localized to four major structures within the brain, the first of which is the sensory motor cortex, which can be seen in the primary, secondary, and tertiary areas of both the sensory and motor areas in the brain. Procedural memory also involves a striatum, which can be seen in the medial view of the brain. The basal ganglia is also involved in procedural memory, consisting of the putamen, the caudate nucleus, and the globus pallidus. Also, the cerebellum, known for coordinating movements, is involved in procedural memory. The last type of implicit memory we will discuss is emotional conditioning. Emotional conditioning is the memory system that links perceptual information to an emotional response. For example, seeing a friend in a crowd of people causes a person to feel happy. Emotional conditioning may be affected by a priming effect in which the repetition of your stimulus exaggerates the emotional response, and it can also be influenced by a conditional reflex, such as jumping out of a car's way as you cross the street. Overall, the different types of memory combine to form an executive memory, which can carry out the functions as influenced by perceptual memory, which is largely influenced by the brain regions that receive sensory information. The many different types of memory reveal the complexity of the brain in processing information about the world around us.